And so in the book of Matthew, if you would turn there with me as we pick up where we left off last week, Matthew chapter number 7, uh, this morning I'm going to do an introduction and speak to a negative side of what is being said here, and then next week I'm going to turn into the positive side as to what the actual exhortation is that Jesus has given us. So read with me in Matthew chapter number 7. Last week we spoke about not being anxious uh, in the chapter 6, and now we go into chapter 7, and it says this, judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before the pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. This is one of those passages of Scripture that I believe is one of the most quoted, but yet the most misquoted passages of Scripture. Uh, people use it in jest, and I understand that. Uh, I, I hear that. I hear, th hear this all the time in um, my house, don't judge me. And we do that in a joke, you know, my kids will be sitting there and they'll do something like odd and then they'll look at me and say, don't judge me. Uh, I, I remember last year uh, there was um, a lady in our church who took her son to the, the hospice or, or um, whatever it was they had here uh, or the, 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 the thrift store. And her son took a toilet seat and put it over his head, and it got stuck. I mean, that thing was literally stuck. Uh, I won't mention the boy's name, but it starts with a Q, and he's in this part of this church. But moving on. So this little boy had, his, had this toilet seat on his head, and the mother placed it on Facebook, and she said, yes, that's my child with a toilet seat on his head. Don't judge me. And uh, so it's funny when people use this don't judge me thing in jest, and I understand that. But all the time I hear people saying this, don't judge lest you be judged. Who are you to judge? Or even when they're speaking to me and they will say something like, well, you know, um, I saw this happen. And then they said, well, yeah, I don't want to judge, but. So the question is to judge or not to judge. And I think the answer is this, is to make Righteous judgment in an unrighteous world. Making righteous judgment in an unrighteous world. It is here where we look at this passage and Jesus says, Do not judge that you be not judged. Well, what is he saying? Jesus, are you saying that we should not make uh, judgment calls? Is that what you're saying? Are we not to judge? What is it when you're saying judge? Well, this word judge is used in different ways throughout the scriptures. At times, it is used uh, to speak about discernment. But in the context it's speaking of, it is speaking of condemnation. Uh, and it's speaking of right judgment. In other words, do not judge the heart. We can't see the heart of a person. God sees the heart. But we can make judgment calls, uh, righteous judgment calls, when we look at actions. So is Jesus saying, you shall not judge? I don't believe he is. I believe he is saying this, do not judge the heart. So I'm going to go through a, 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 an introduction this morning speaking about what Jesus is not saying. And then next week I will speak about what Jesus is saying. So here is first the understanding of the immediate context. Remember, whenever we look at scripture, we want to look at context. 
The immediate context is Jesus is on the mountainside. This is the Sermon of the Mount. He's drawing people to him. He's speaking to his disciples. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're all around him. And remember, they're the hypocrites. Throughout the whole time, Jesus has been pointing at the Pharisees. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. And he's continually pointing at the hypocrites, the, the Pharisees. They were Pharisaical. They were saying one thing with their mouth, but doing something else. And so he's speaking about, do not judge. Uh, and when you do judge, remember this, that the, the measure you use will be measured to you. And so he's speaking and directing, he speak directly, I believe, to the Pharisees and speaking to the, the masses that they would understand this, that when they make a judgment to make a right judgment or a righteous judgment. So the immediate context is the idea that he's speaking about the hypocrites. But secondly, the greater context of Scripture when we take the greater context of Scripture, Scripture never contradicts Scripture, right? Uh, in other words, God's never going to contradict Himself. He's never going to say, do not judge, and then say, judge. He'll never contradict Himself. So when you go to the book of John, chapter number 7, and I'll read it to you very quickly. John, chapter number 7, and verse number 24, this is what Jesus would say. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Do not judge by appearances, but judge by right judgment. And so Jesus is saying we should judge. You know the times that the apostle John would write in first and second and third John and make judgment calls. He would even speak of a man by the name of Diotrephes that, that uh, is, is walking away and Diotrephes needs to be dealt with severely. You know when Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he would say that there's sin amongst you. Kick out the immoral brother. Hand him over to Satan that his soul might be saved. Wow, Paul, you're a pretty judgmental man. Wow, Jesus would speak to the, the Pharisees and walk in to the temple and throw their tables over and say to the money changers, get out of here. You have turned my father's house into a, a den of robbers. Jesus, Jesus, did you not say, do not judge? How can you call them a den of robbers if you yourself said, do not judge? Did Jesus say, do not judge? Within the greater context of Scripture, Jesus said, we are not to condemn. And the judgment of the heart is a work of God. But even we are to look to help one another. Did Jesus not teach us in Matthew chapter 18, if a brother is caught in a sin, that we should go and restore him, that we should go and help one another? Did, is that not what is spoken about uh, throughout the Scriptures, that we should help each other, that we should judge, we should look to the fruits? In fact, in this very Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying here, remove the speck from your eye, so, or the log from your eye, so you can remove the speck from someone else's. In fact, he says in the last verse I read, verse 6, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before the pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Well, how do we know who the dogs are and who the pigs are if we're not going to make a judgment call? We're speaking about discernment. In fact, Jesus further on in uh, Matthew 7 Verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Verse 26, Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Wow. So Jesus is saying that we should be discerning, and the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Church, when you say, do not judge, and you do not mean it in the way Jesus means it, you place yourself in a very awkward predicament because this is what it ends up. So we have an airplane flying into the Twin Towers, and you say that is evil. Agreed? Do not judge. Who are you to judge? Oh, well, well, now we have someone that blows up the runners on the Boston Marathon. Evil? Who are you to judge? 
And now you have someone breaking into your house and, and, and raping your children. Who are you to judge? So is Jesus saying that we should not make any discerning calls? Is he saying we should not judge? You put yourself in a great predicament when your interpretation of do not judge means do not make a discerning call. Do not view things from a righteous point of view. I believe Jesus is saying here, and I'll speak about that next week, and there's a way to apply this, and we will get there next week. But Jesus is saying this, in an unrighteous world, make righteous judgments. In a world of, no, of non-judgmentalism, be judgmental in the sense of making a righteous judgment. So we've understood now the biblical context that, that, that Jesus is uh, throughout telling us to be discerning and to be judging. Now let's understand our context, the context in which we live in. Uh, we live in a context of great inclusivism. But for me to get there, I have to take you back to a, an era that was known as the modern era. The modern era runs approximately from creation through Martin Luther. And this, in this modern era, people would say this, or sorry, the pre-modern era, people would say this, truth can be known, truth does exist, and truth is revealed by God through His Son and the Word. There was always that understanding that they at least could know truth, and God would be the one that would reveal that truth. God's Word was honored as the truth. Then you go to modern era. Modern era begins around about 1650, and it ended around about 1950s. In the modern era, there was a complete change. In the modern era, there was the, 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 the thought that, uh, yes, truth does exist, but it needs to be found through science and arguments uh, and opinions of men and the senses. And so this is what they would say, yes, truth does exist, but truth is the way I see it. Truth is uh, what science says. Truth is, and they placed no value on the Bible, no value on God, and religion was done away with. In fact, religion was then treated as being nothing but a superstition. And so we had men rising like Nietzsche, and Nietzsche would... Uh, boldly proclaim that God is dead, and we would have a man by the name of Voltaire that would make a snide comment that a man, uh, God created man in his own image, and man returned the favor. And what he is trying to say is that God was nothing but a figment of the imagination. So God was declared as dead, religion was declared as superstition, the sciences and the senses were now becoming the basis for truth. But at least they recognized that there was something called truth. Now we find ourselves in a postmodern era. It began around about the 1950s. Postmodernism says this there is no truth. There's no truth. There's no such thing as an absolute truth. You cannot really judge anything because there's no standard by which you can judge it. Because it's what I feel and what I think. And this may be true for you, but, but that's true for me. And so there is no absolute truth except the assertion that there is no absolute truth. And so here we have a time in which we live in when people say, well, we really don't know. And you really cannot know because truth does not exist. And so now we have what is called inclusivism. It has come into the church. And so this is what inclusivism looks like. Well, yes, Jesus is Lord. Yes, Jesus died for your salvation. Uh, yes, Jesus Christ is, the, is a, a way to salvation. But, but you know what? Buddhism is also a way to salvation, and Confucianism is also a way, and, and the Hindu gods, the, the millions that exist, they are also a way to salvation. And, and even though all of these worldviews are absolutely contradictory, they are accepted because we live in a time of inclusivism. But how does a church function in an inclusive world where we have an exclusive gospel? How does a church function in an inclusive world where we have an exclusive gospel? 
We have now been toting this thing for I don't know how long. We are now the most tolerant nation there is. But yet we're intolerant of anything that would contradict what we tolerate. In this, that we have not become a tolerant uh, nation, but we have become the most intolerant nation that you've ever seen. And people keep saying, don't judge me. In fact, I was standing in a, a McDonald's one day, and I think it was a McDonald's, and there was a guy standing in front of me and tattooed on the back of his neck with these words, only God will judge me. And I wanted to pat him on his back and say, you're right, and so it will be. God will judge you. You see, the reality is there is only one judge, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father has given all judgment to him. But that does not mean that we live today as if there is no truth or standard by which we can make a righteous judgment. There is a righteous standard, and that standard is Jesus Christ and his word. This is the standard by which we make all judgments. When we want to know how to act, we go to the word of God. When we want to know what to do, we, we go to the word of God. When we want to know what to believe, we go to the word of God. God's word is the centerpiece in the puzzle, if you would, of our world view. Our worldview is built in and through the Bible. God's word is that which draws the line for us. We don't get to do what a gentleman by the name of Jacques Derrida began to do, and it was called deconstructionism. When he started to deconstruct, he said, yes, that's fine. We'll accept your Bible as the truth. But what we have to do is we have to deconstruct and break it out and reinterpret it. And this had a, its, its impact throughout the world that now it was no longer things could be judged on face value, but everything had to be, de be deconstructed and reinterpreted to fit that individual person. In other words, it resulted in an individual truth which did not exist because there is no absolute truth. I'm not trying to be smart. I hope you understand that. I'm showing you the silliness of the times in which we live in. It's a time in which the truth has now been replaced. It has been replaced with a sense of fairness. People don't want to know what the truth is anymore. They want to know, is that fair? Is this fair? And so truth has been renamed fairness. So how do we see that in our culture today? Well, it's very easy. That's not fair that I cannot go to the bathroom of my choice. That's not fair that I don't get to marry my, my uh, uh, same-sex partner. That's not fair. Are we about fairness or truth? You see, the truth is what God has revealed. If we were about fairness, specifically salvation, we would all go to hell. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. In all fairness, we all should pay the wage of death. But because God is a God of grace, He has given us eternal life. When you are reinterpreting truth by a sense of fairness, you are faced with a very difficult uh, task of trying to explain the narrow and the broad roads. Jesus said, narrow is the road that leads to salvation, and few will find it. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many will find it. Well, that's not fair, but it's the truth. What about morality? If you're looking at morality from a fairness point of view, then, then you place yourself in a very difficult position. Because now, when a person rapes your spouse or molests your children and you want to act out on them, they say, that's not fair that I can't do what I want to do. What trumps is truth. And we live in a time in which the truth has been exchanged for a sense of fairness. We live in a time when 
Truth has been replaced by a sense of sensuality. It's how I feel. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, do it. No longer if it's the truth, if it is a right thing to do, if it is according to the standard. It's now if it feels good, do it. And so if ever you go to a Christian counselor and they say, well, how do you feel about that? And you say, well, I feel like it could be a do it. Oh, no, no, you want to go to a Christian counselor that will take the Word of God and say, I don't care what you feel. This is the Word of God. Act accordingly. Because this is truth. Truth trumps sensuality. And so the standard today is, if it feels good, do it, versus self-denial, taking up a cross and following Him. Uh, Truth has now been exchanged for feelings and emotions and and our feelings and our emotions go up and they go down and they go up and they go down and our opinions are up and our opinions are down and our opinions change but God's word never changes regardless of how we might feel and so we live in that time a time of do not judge lest you be judged and the only reason why people are misusing that is because they do not want to be judged according to righteous standard. Now, obviously, there is wrong judgment, and that is condemnation. I'm going to speak about that next week, what Jesus is saying. But I'm telling you now what he's not saying. He's not saying do not make a discerning judgment. That's not his, that is what he's saying. Sorry, that flew right over my own head. That must have been pretty good. <laughs> Thirdly, truth is replaced by pragmatism. If it works, do it. If it works, do it. Well, we see that in the church today. Hey, if it works, do it. If it's going to draw a crowd, do it. Whether it be biblical or not biblical, do it. We see that all the time. We have churches all around playing rock music in the churches. We have people making women wear dresses down to their toes. And they're saying it works for us. It will do it. No, no, it's not whether it works. It's what is God's word? What's God's word on this thing? I always say to, to our, uh, our leadership at Lake Lewis Church, remember, what you give to get them, you're going to have to give to keep them. If you're going to have to give away cars and televisions and hot dogs and fancy little sayings and fancy little things, you're going to have to give that to keep them. But if you will give them the word of God and the love of Christ, The God of the word and the love of the Christ will keep them. Because truth is not what works. Truth is what it is. And we are called to obedience. Lastly, truth has been replaced by mysticism. We have a big movement right now of Eastern mysticism. Everyone is spiritual. Everyone's spiritual. You know, it's, uh, you go up into, into uh, Chimney Rock and you will see how many of our shops, as much as I love some of the shop owners or our, our place, uh, everyone's got a dream catcher and everyone's got a, 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 a crystal and everyone's got a, a ball and uh, we have crystal bowl meditation is what we had right here in our own town. Crystal bowl meditation. To center your spirit. Because everyone's spiritual. And so as long as it's spiritual, do it. Religion and relationship is out. Spiritualism is in. I don't need a church. I just walk in nature. The nature is my church. I don't have to go to a church to meet with God. I meet with my God in a different way. Do not forsake the gathering of yourselves. You are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. You see, it's not about spiritualism. It is now all about relationship with the all-knowing, all-wise God that in his wisdom sent his only begotten son to die on an old rugged cross that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, that we might live in victory for, with Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? It is if you believe in truth. 
if you believe there's a standard by which you can judge. But if you have decided there is no standard by which you can judge, you have placed yourself on a sandy soil as your foundation. We live in a time the Apostle Paul wrote about when people will turn away from the truth and they will turn aside to myth. And they will gather around themselves those teachers that will teach what their itching ears want to hear. Now, I've heard many preachers speak on that. And they always put the emphasis on this. Those preachers that are scratching itchy ears, I think they put the emphasis on the wrong place. They need to put the emphasis on those people that gather the teachers to themselves for their ears to be scratched. You see, those people are getting what they're asking for. They're asking for ears to be scratched. And so they gather that teacher that they want. People have turned aside from the truth and turned aside to myth. Turning away from the truth. What is truth? It's a great question. Pilate asked that exact same question of Jesus. I wish he had waited just a few seconds so that Jesus could have answered him. But the word of God is truth. How do you know that? Well, didn't Jesus say in his prayer in John 17, 17, when he said to us that, uh, or he was praying to the Father, and he said, Father, sanctify them or change them into my likeness. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Is the word truth? If you say no, then you've got to say Jesus is a liar. If you say Jesus is a liar, he's a sinner. If Jesus is a sinner, he couldn't be the, the spotless lamb of God without blemish or defect. Therefore, he was disqualified to die for your sin, and therefore you're in your sins and you're going to hell. You've disqualified Christ by disagreeing that the word of God is truth. Because Jesus said it is. But Jesus didn't only say that his word is truth, but he also said that he is truth. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So can truth be known? Yes, there is. Is Jesus saying that there is no truth? Oh, no. What he is saying, that there is a standard, and we can judge accordingly. We cannot redefine the standard as our culture has redefined, as the Pharisees were redefining all the time. And when people say, do not judge, lest you be judged, I believe it's because they do not want a righteous judgment held on them. They do not want to be held up against the standard who is Jesus Christ. So was Jesus saying we cannot judge? No, he did not say that. That is a misquoted verse. Come next week, and I'm going to tell you what he was saying. How should we judge? Why should we judge? When do we judge? How is this to be applied to my life? And so it will be a whole lot more practical and a whole lot less aimed at your head as we try this week. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is truth. I thank you that even in amidst a, a world of non judgmentalism, God, you are the the almighty judge, and Father, we know that your word has said that you have entrusted all judgment to your son, and that we will all appear before your judgment seat one day. And so I pray, Father, that you would help us today to live in such a way that we would only do what you want us to do, that God, we would not judge the heart of man, but that we would be discerning of actions, and Father, that we could be the salt and the light into a very dark world. Use us, Lord, for your glory, and this I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And you are dismissed.